All right, let's go. All right, hey everyone, welcome. My name is Bedr Youssef. I'm a technical educator at the Web3 Foundation. I mainly focus on the code aspect of things. Um, so really about building blockchains with Substrate and deploying them on Polkadot and everything to do with Rust and kind of the development side of things. If you ask me more about com uh, conceptual uh, concepts about Polkadot, I, I'm more knowledgeable on the side of the engineering. So yeah, in this workshop and really kind of more an overview, we're going to go over a lot of different concepts. Uh, this workshop will really focus on introducing you to Rust in general, but then also dive more verbosely into how Rust is used in the Polkadot SDK and in Substrate. Because going from vanilla Rust to even something like Ink, look what Sasha just showed, you see how it's a little bit, it can be a little bit different. There's some different syntax. And while Ink is a pretty uh, easy representation, I would say ru what Rust looks like, when you get into Substrate, there are definitely some things and concepts which are reoccurring, but also take time to get used to. Um, so yeah, these are just the learning goals of this thing. We want to install Rust and its tooling, which most of you already have, thanks to Sasha, which is really, really good. We don't really have to go through that. Uh, we want to learn the basics of Rust, and then along with why it's actually good for building blockchain specifically, and it sounds kind of like like a buzzwordy thing, but there's actually some very good uh, engineering um, decisions made behind why you'd want to choose Rust when you're building a blockchain. Uh, learn why Rust is important. Just Oh yeah, that's kind of the same point two times. Uh, we want to learn to write some basic Rust, and then of course the importance of generic programming since that's primarily what um, Substrate goes over. And that's pretty much the same thing. So again, if you haven't installed Rust, this is how you do it. I think everyone has pretty much Rust installed or Right? If I'm correct, everyone here pretty much either has it installed or if you're following along. Okay, nice. Um, lastly, there is a workshop here, uh, and I didn't make it that accessible to, to get to, but if you can go to my GitHub, which is right here, crack the code 016, it should be right at the top, intro to Rust workshop .git, and you can go ahead and just get that cloned from now would be great. This is kind of the only setup you probably have to do. So I can give you kind of a minute to do that. Um, if you have trouble getting to it, just raise your hand, let me know if you can get to it, and uh, I can come over and assist you, or Sasha can also probably assist you. And once you do have it installed, then you can go ahead and just make sure everything is working uh, in the root of the project. So you should be going into CD, uh, you should go into the directory of the, uh, where is it? Oh, there it is. So you should be right here inside of your Web0 Intro to Rust directory or intro to Rust, it should be called for you. And you should be able to run cargo run dash dash bin scratch pad. And you'll notice that this is a project which has actually multiple Rust projects within, which is why we specify, specify dash dash bin. Um, it's called a scratch pad because we're just gonna be writing a bunch of different kinds of code inside of here. And once you do run it, then you should be able to see hello world. And that's kind of your verification that your project is cloned and working and everything like that. So. I'll give you a couple of minutes just to do that. And if you have any problems, just raise a hand. Yeah. Yeah, I probably should have done that. Like the actual repo? Yeah, they're, it's funny because they're actually in the repo, so we have like a recursion problem. But I can I can share them. Uh, is there like a common place where everyone is where I can just share links and stuff? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know you could do this. Uh, oh, right here, save and share. QR code. Oh, nice. Okay, so there you go. I didn't know you could do that. That's so cool. Yeah. So Yeah, so if you guys want to, this is just a general um vanilla Rust repository. Nothing too too special about it. It really just, you know, will just be and also all the slides are here. The link to the slides are right there in the top of the README. Um and then the README itself has like all the context you will need. can just download it and display it larger. Yeah. Uh, so a scratch pad, it's kind of just like a place. Well, that's not big enough. Um, it's just a place where we can write code. Um, it, it doesn't mean anything in Rust. It's just what I called it. It's just what our project name is. I just call it scratch pad because you can, it's kind of like a notepad, a blank notepad. You can put whatever you want inside of there. 
including the workshop code, including, you know, regular Rust code, whatever you want. So I just call it Scratchpad. It's not like a... Yes, yeah, no, no, it's, yeah, it's not like a Rust thing. I probably should have just called it, like, project or something simple. I just call it Scratchpad. Um, so, okay, nice. So if everyone, if that's clear, if everyone's able to access it, which hopefully everyone has done that. Okay, nice. We can kind of continue. So, and again, you can run cargo run dash dash bin scratch pad once you CD into that repository and that verifies that it's all working. So if everyone wants to give that a run and then give a show of hands if you've managed to run that, then that would be great. Nice. Okay, we have one. Two. Three. Are you good or do you want to, is it okay to, if we keep going or do you want to uh, give it a go? So that's just bin. So this actually, this specific repository has, it's a project that has multiple Rust projects inside. It's called a workspace and we'll get into what that means. So dash dash bin means that we want to run an executable called Scratchpad inside of our Rust project. Since our uh, project is called Scratchpad, um, then that's how we want to specify, okay, I want to run specifically just the code inside of this package and not in another package. So we specify dash dash bin, followed by the package name of the thing that we want to run. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and just keep going here. So yeah, again, and this is a cargo cheat sheet and kind of gets into a little bit of what was said before. So we have three main cargo commands when you're developing Rust projects. You have cargo check, which is less than actually building something all the way through. It just checks if it can compile. And typically it takes less time than if you were just to run cargo build or cargo run or whatever. Um, then you have cargo run, which builds and runs a project all in one command. And then you have cargo build, which just builds the project and provides an executable. So now let's get into the Rust and Polkadot history. Uh, while you guys, you guys feel free to poke around the project and kind of do whatever you want. So Rust launched in like 2015, and then the white paper for Polkadot came out in 2016 with the first kind of genesis block for Polkadot being generated in 2020. Now Polkadot was written in Rust. You can see how they're very closely linked. So it was obvious that you were starting to, they were starting to engineer Polkadot close to actually the early versions of Rust. And you can actually kind of see that progression in the code. Um, and of course, Polkadot is written in Rust, so is Substrate and Cumulus. And these are tools for building blockchains from scratch, which we'll get into soon. So Polkadot also has lots of contributions to the Rust space. I just want to go over this quickly. So things like WASMI, WebAssembly Interpreter, PokaVM, which is a RISC-V-based virtual machine, which can also be as a serve as a replacement for WASMI, maybe in the future, we'll see. Uh, things like the Scale Codec, which is a very simple binary serialization format, and contributions to libraries like libp2p, and libraries that are generally used throughout not just the blockchain ecosystem, but in the wider Rust ecosystem. Just by virtue of Polkadot being involved with Rust from such an early uh, time, they're able to make these very key contributions. So why Rust for blockchains? And if you just want to summarize it in one sentence, it's safe and it's fast code. You can write memory safe code very, very quickly without having to be uh, really like a low level engineer. For example, if you've ever written C or C++, you know you have to worry about memory management to a degree and it's pretty difficult. Uh, but with Rust, it takes care of all that for you while enabling you to still get at the level that a low level language can kind of give you. So it's a good option for sensitive applications, right? And another big, big um, plus is the type system is super, it's strict, but also really extensible. It's good for writing strict APIs. So it lets you really get very custom but also very strict in that you know the compiler will, will yell at you if you do something wrong with those types. So you can be sure while writing Rust that you're not spending time necessarily on issues other than the thing that you're actually writing. So it makes it very versatile um, and perfect for blockchains. Also, this came out recently, a press release by the White House where they were actually, they cited Rust in the paper on why, um, <laughs> on why that really we should be using memory safe languages to kind of avoid the, the problems that come with low-level programming in general. So just something fun. So here's an example of Rust yelling at you, exhibit number one. If you write Rust, you're going to get used to the Rust compiler always spitting out error messages at you, which can kind of make your head go around. Um, one of these concepts is called ownership in Rust, and it's really just for avoiding common memory management mistakes. So for example, let's say I have a function called take my value, which takes an argument of a string, and I just print that string out, doesn't really do anything special. And in, in my main function, um, 
I call this function using a string. And then later, after I call that function, I want to print it out after I use this function. And what you'll find is that it actually will not let you do that. That's because my name, the variable my name, was taken ownership by take my value. So in essence, this, um, and then it was dropped at the end of the scope of using this. So you can see how we can mitigate, obviously we can mitigate this by using like a reference to it instead of actually taking the value. But that's just one example of Rust kind of protecting you from using something which could have been invalid later, since my name would have been invalid in memory after using it within this function. And yeah, more stuff about Rust, because why not? Rust can compile to WebAssembly, which is a big deal, lets you have portable targets. I've seen many cases where, for example, if you can compile your Rust code to WebAssembly, then you can use that WebAssembly backend in something else like C++, JavaScript, TypeScript. For example, I wrote like my, my website in Rust, and it compiles to WebAssembly. Um, and, then, you know, and then JavaScript can, can kind of talk to that and just have a normal website. Yep, in summary, Rust use cases are just, you can use it for pretty much everything. Um, with varying degrees of complexity, of course, it's not really, you know, and in some cases it's easier to use than others. For a web-based context, it can be a little bit, you know, finicky to work with, but in lower level systems programming, it's great. Yep. This one? Oh yeah, um, we can get into this a little later because I'm going to get into the Rust basic concepts. But what you do is notice how we're just taking in a, like a, a pure string, right? What we could do, and then what happens in Rust is um, the scope of functions really matter. So for example, when a scope ends, and when I say scope, I mean when the curly brace begins, and then when it ends, um, the mem everything within these brackets gets dropped from memory. So if I take um, string and I use it in this function, by here, by this line, it's going to be dropped from memory. Meaning that if I try to use this later, like down here, it's no longer existent because this function already kind of consumed it. We can solve that by using a reference to it instead. And there's syntax for that. You just use an asterisk percent symbol, take a reference to string, and then give it back to the main function versus just taking it from the main function and then it just gets erased from memory after take my value is finished running. Any other questions before we move on to Rust 101? No? OK, nice. So now we're going to quickly go over some Rust concepts. And this is not meant to really like, you know, um, there's a lot more to Rust. And these are just some of the highlights. Really, the biggest resource you're going to use as a Rust developer is the Rust book. It kind of has everything in there along with sample projects. Um, that's the best resource. but. We're just going to go over some of the behavior of Rust, some of the syntax, just to get yourself kind of familiarized with it. So the first thing about Rust as purely a programming language, it's strongly and statically typed, so everything has a type. It focuses on memory safety, combines concepts of object-oriented and functional programming. So you'll often find this interesting kind of intersection between the two of these design patterns being used in Rust and powerful management memory system without using a garbage collector. So unlike a language like Python or JavaScript where you need a runtime and then that runtime has a garbage collector, it can introduce some uh, computational overhead. This is just all statically compiled and run as a like an elf binary or whatever on your computer. And then just some terminology before we get deeper. So a Rust project or a package is usually called a crate. And then a workspace is multiple crates combined into a single project. And then Cargo, which we've used already, is our build tool. So similar to something like NPM, right, um, or any other build slash configuration tool, that's what Cargo is for us. So first thing about Rust is variables. And this is probably one of the first things you will encounter as being some uh, showing some interesting behavior, which you're not going to be really used to. All variables are immutable by default. Now, immutable means that you can't change the value. You have to explicitly say, hey, I want to be able to change this variable later using the mute or mut, however you say it, a keyword. So you can see here if we say age of type U32, an unsigned 32-bit integer is equal to 22, and then I want to add one to it later, it's not going to let me do that. But if I say let age, let a mutable age, let M-U-T age, um, and I changed the type for some reason, but it's, it's the same thing basically. It's just an unsigned 64-bit integer is equal to 22. Then I can modify it because I said I'm okay with modifying this variable. And this is done for safety. So that way you don't modify variables accidentally later. You have to explicitly make that decision 
to modify that variable. OK, and here's all the different common collection types in Rust. Now, a vector is a growable array. Normally, array, an array inside of Rust is something which is static in memory um, in order to actually use a growable array to push things to and pop and do all those normal things. You would use what's called a vector or a vec. Um, but you can see here, you can actually create a vector pretty easily just by typing uh, vec with an exclamation mark and then whatever you want to put inside of that array. Um, Alternative syntax, you know, the full syntax is something like uh, like below, which is let vector is equal to vec colon colon new, and we'll get into kind of how that uh, comes uh, comes about soon. Next thing, we have a hash map, which is akin to a set or a dictionary. You know, it's just a uh, mapping of a key to a value, and you can see here also how generics come into play, where we want to map unsigned 32-bit integer to another unsigned 32-bit integer, such that if we um, insert that, we can, you know, kind of get ID for value, ID for value, etc. And lastly, may come as a, as a surprise, is the string type, a capital S string. Now note that this is actually different from just a common uh, string. Normally when you write a string in Rust, if you're not using this type, then again it will be um, in your binary, and you can't change it, it'll be immutable. So this string is something which you can actually change. Uh, you can actually add characters, you know, it uh, comes with a bunch of different functions like search, replace, splice, all the things that you're normally used to inside of a programming language. And functions are pretty self-explanatory. You declare it using fn, and then you can have parameters. Each parameter has to be typed. It's not like JavaScript where you can't have a type. You have to have a type for each of your parameters. And then, um, let's see, and then your return syntax is just the arrow, so a dash and an arrow, and then to the type you want to return. And notice something interesting is that we can actually return without saying return. We just have to remove the semicolon, and that uh, signifies a return for us. So it's pretty concise syntax. I could write return age plus one semicolon, or I could just say age plus one, and that's also perfectly valid. Now, structs in Rust, if you've coded in Solidity or you know pretty much any other language, decide to declare your custom data structure. So struct followed by the name of the struct, and then the fields within that struct so name, string, age, u32, et cetera, et cetera. And then of course, you can have structs within your struct. So I can say, um, you know, my name is of type name. And then that name has its own fields and so on. And structs can be extended. So you'll notice in the rest, we don't really have like classes or anything. We just kind of have structs. And you can add methods to structs by using this um, impl keyword, so impl you know, implement person. And then within here, you can put in your various methods. For example, here's kind of a constructor method, right? Where we can create like a new person, where later it will look like this. And notice how we use the double colon syntax to call this kind of constructor method. And this returns a new instance of person. And then this function, which is also part of the person implementation, um, simply takes in an already instantiated person. So let's say I create a new person. And then I can do person dot say name later, but I have to have a person created first. This one returns a person, right? Returns self, capital S self, which refers to this person type. And then say name is saying, okay, well, I expect a reference to self. I want to be created first, and then I can say name, like so. And that's why you you would use the dot syntax. And this will become a little clearer later on as well. Now traits. Traits is how you define custom behavior for an object. And for example, let's say I want to have a trait called sound. And I can apply sound on different structs. right? So I can say, well, I want to implement a sound for a person. And every time I implement a trait, I have to implement all the methods associated. So this trait sound has a function called make sound. And I have to implement that for the person. So for example, uh, people say hello, so I say hello. If I was going to implement sound for a dog, then I would probably say something else um, or nothing at all. So yeah, and then later on you can, and then this method for, from trace sound becomes available to person. Okay, and I might start going through these kind of quickly because there's quite a few concepts here. Um, there's some common traits you can use which give you extra utility like cloning things in memory, um, printing things out conveniently using the debug trait, and then there's this m handy macro which allows you to do that. Um, Rust generics, a placeholder for a type. And you, you can see here, for example, let's say we had a calculator, we want to use different number data types. So we could say uh, that the struct calculator can accept different types of numbers for its results. Then we have associated types, which are another type of generic. 
and they can be used to configure traits. And this is where we get more into generic APIs. So for example, let's say I had a factory and I had a type product and I don't quite want to define what the product is yet. I want to maybe have multiple factories that produce different types of products, which is why this is kind of generic. And then you can see here how we can even use uh, traits to ensure that we have the right kind of product. Now, what's the difference between associated types and generics? They're both generic, but how do you actually differentiate? So an associated type, you only use when you want to implement the trait one time. For example, let's say I have an EVM runtime and I want to implement a configuration for that Ethereum runtime. I'm only going to instantiate this one time. So it makes sense that I would want to supply these types just that, just that one time. For example, a generic, if you want to use a function like multiple times, let's say, then you would want to use a generic as then you could say, okay, well, I want to square a signed 32-bit number, an unsigned 32-bit number, a floating point number, et cetera. And then finally, what we have, what are called trait bounds. And this is bringing generics and traits together. So we can actually limit generics by their trait. And this essentially says that, okay, I only want to accept generics that implement these traits. So for example, I can say in this function makes lots of noise, I only want to accept traits um, that implement the trait sound. And in some cases, generics and associated types can work together with trait bounds. And this looks kind of like some gnarly syntax, but yeah, you can also do this. And notice this editor um, uh, operator here where we can just actually have multiple traits, um, multiple trait bounds per generic. So you can put a long list of different traits for your generic type. And that way you can actually, you know, call the, fu the, um, the functions from that trait on your generic parameter. Let's see. Yep, and here's just another example. So trait bounds, again, so we had the calculator. We want to only restrict, restrict it to types that can count. So that's where we use a trait bound. And macros. And macros are pretty simple to understand. It's just code that generates code. It eliminates a lot of boilerplate. So for example, the print line macro, which we use to print things out, uh, usually looks like this. It's a very kind of nasty line of code. But luckily, we have the macro to shorten it down for us. And then the macro itself is written usually in syntax like this, and this is a declarative macro. And if you ever want to look at the code behind a macro, there's a tool called Cargo Expand, which you can always install. And to run Cargo Expand, um, you can run it in kind of any crate, and it will expand all those macros for you inside of that crate. So let's put it together and go back to generic programming. That was kind of a you know, really quick one-on-one -on, -one on some of the Rust concepts, like traits, generics, associated types. Um, what did that do? Oh, okay. Um, so to put it together, so what's generic programming, right? It's making assumptions about behavior, but not really the implementation itself. So it's saying, here's how I want this thing to act, but I don't really care about, you know, what it looks like, essentially. Um, and then generic traits let us create reusable APIs. Um, a good example of this in use is something like polka dot, right? blocks, transactions, fork choice rules, consensus, all these things are generic by nature. So you can actually customize these things because they're generic. So you can say, I want my block to look like this. I want my fork choice rule for my consensus to look like this, et cetera. And then you use traits as sort of like that guiding thing to say, okay, well, I know it's going to implement these methods. So I know that my API will uh, act this way, but I can change how it acts. But I know that the API will always stay the same. Right, and we'll get into pallets kind of later. Um, I think what we'll go into now is the actual workshop. That was a pretty comprehensive introduction into Rust, just so when you look at some of these things, um, it won't be so complex. So what's our goal here? The goal is a factory, and our, we want to provide a way to create factories for multiple processes of the same kind. Basically, what we want to do is go from a raw material, put that through some process, and then get a final product at the end of that. Uh, an example is like taking like iron ore, and then we want to process that into steel. So what does that kind of look like? So you can open up scratchpad slash source slash factory dot rs, and I'm gonna go ahead and do that um, on my screen as well. Let's see where did I put it. There it is. So you can see here. Is that big enough? Yeah, it should be big enough. So you can see here down in Scratchpad, source, and factory.rs, you're going to notice a bunch of structs, traits. Um, the first thing we'll go over is the factory struct. And you'll notice some interesting syntax. So the factory struct takes in a generic parameter, which is p, which is a process, right? It just 
And what we're saying is, okay, I don't care what this type is. All I care about is that it has a process, right? And then of course our factory has some arbitrary data like a factory ID, it has multiple processes, and then completed products. And if you notice something interesting is we're actually able to access what a product looks like from this generic parameter, and that's because of the associated type. So let me go ahead and actually skip around to that. So if I go to the process trait, which is kind of like the beating heart of this thing, right? Again, what I'm saying is I'm not trying to define a specific process. I just want to know what a process looks like. In this case, my process takes in a raw material and a product, right, which are themselves also types. And then all I care about is pushing it along the belt, right? Imagine a conveyor belt where it's kind of moving along. And then um, I want to you know, return a product from that. And notice how we're using the associated types that we declare as part of the traits within our functions. So let's go back into our code. And again, everything is pretty much implemented for you. If you scroll through factory.rs, everything should be here. And if it's not, just raise your hand. But it should all be here, all these different functions. So that we have various functions. And I won't go into all these in detail, but things like creating a new factory, processing all the things inside of our factory, adding a new process to our factory, running the factory, et cetera. And then notice here, um, I talk, remember I talked about the raw material and product generic types? Well, here's where we can actually use those. So our raw material is iron ore, which is just a struct and just has some arbitrary amount as its field. Then our product is steel. And then our process, which we use to um, which we're going to implement our process traits, then we can implement that on top of or process, right? This is how we're going to process iron to steel. Yeah, and these just kind of go through those methods. Um, but yeah, again, the process trait is really the main thing to take away, f take away from here. Notice that we're not just saying, okay, my factory does one process. No, I can say, here's my blueprint for how I want a process to look. Let me create a factory that processes metal. Let me create a factory that processes something else, whatever. Um, so the main thing I want you guys to do, and we're going to kind of do it together, is we're going to work on implementing the process for our process. Yep. Oh, it's private? Uh, it should... I think you should ignore it. If it comes up later, it's it's as simple as adding pub behind trait, if, it, if that is the case. So if we run into problems later running it, um, then, then we'll fix it. But I think it'll be fine. It worked for me earlier. Um, so it shouldn't really be a big deal. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see if it affects it later. So um, because actually, the, the thing is, we won't have to use process when we run it. We're going to use or process. Process is just our trait. We're really going to be using the OR process. So uh, let's go ahead and go through this line by line. right? So first, what I'm going to do is I want to implement this trait process for OR process. I'm going to make this actually even bigger and close this up. So I'm going to say impl process, right? implement process for OR process. And then what I want to do is I want to now fill in my associated types. So type raw material. And I want to say my raw material is iron ore. And then my second associated type is the product. So type product is equal to steel. And you can see here it's giving us problems because we need to implement the functions for this trait um, because it expects these to be implemented. So we have to implement those, which we'll do. And it's pretty simple. And what I'm going to do is kind of copy paste this. And then um, you guys can just copy it off of here. If you really uh, have trouble kind of writing it, it's also going to be, you know, if you want to kind of cheat a little bit, go into factory source, I mean, that RS, and the completed code is right here. Um, so you could always grab that if you wish. Otherwise, I will leave this uh, kind of up here. And then our last function is the material function, which is kind of the getter for our raw material. Again, the main thing to note here is that it's kind of using our generic types, right? So I'll leave this up here for a little bit. And if you have any uh, problems with this, just let me know.
actually make this slightly smaller. There you go. So you can see the whole thing. And whenever you have it done, just give your hand a raise. If you haven't noticed by now, this is why Rust takes a little bit of time to get used to writing. You can see it's kind of like, you know, some unexpected things here and there. Um, but it's definitely worth it because you get this high level of control. And we'll see in a little bit in Black Polka Dot how this is used exactly. I'll go over that very quickly just to kind of show you, even though it gets a little bit verbose. Yeah, if you guys have, if you guys are ready to move on, then I can go ahead and move on. If there's something you don't understand, please like ask questions, interrupt me anytime. It's completely fine as well. Yep. Yep, this one, material. Okay, so what's happening here is notice, so we have the associated type called raw material, right? And we're saying that that's iron ore. And then later we're saying that we wanna push something along the belt. So imagine we take uh, a material as our parameter uh, what we're doing is we're actually accessing this associated type. So versus me saying something like, you know, hard coding iron ore, what I can do, and while this is like valid technically, I could actually say this, um, un a perfectly va another valid way is to say self, self referring to ore process, right? And then I want to access the types. Yeah, and see how we have access to product, raw material, so we can just use these perpetually throughout our implementation. Um, yeah. And then the same thing for the return type, so self product. And but you know, I could totally just put steel here as well, and that's completely fine. Yep. Yeah, I can go over that quickly. Um, so I'll actually go to this at the scratch pad since you know it's kind of what it's for. Um, so a string here technically, so there's a reference to a string, which is just like a UTFA, just regular old string, right? And it will look something like this. So I can say name string. And the type looks like this. So it's a reference to string lowercase str. And then I can put my name. Um, the thing about this though is like, I can't modify this. I can't really do much with it. Once it's coded here, it's technically inside of the binary of the Rust program when it compiles. It's kind of like a view only uh, thing, you know, um, perspective of that string of characters. It's not very versatile. It doesn't take up as much space and memory as like a dynamically growing string, right? This is stored on the stack, not on the heap. Um, but like, let's say I want to be able to change the string later, right? I have this, look, a big kind of this bigger type, which keeps track of like the capacity. I can do iterations on this. Um, Etc. It gives me way more flexibility, but it's stored on the heap. So it's kind of like a memory, kind of like trade-off, right? The one here is simply storing a reference to something in hard-coded in memory, and that's always going to stay there, and that consumes less memory, um, but I don't get to modify it. It's not a growable array of characters like the capital S string is here. Like, for example, I could say string, and I can call string from, look, there's like a bunch of different APIs which you can use with this specific type. And then I can say, like, of course, I have to make this mutable, so I can change it. And I can say st string dot, um, I don't know. I think you can add a character. Yeah, look, you can get, like, the different characters, indices. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a much more flexible type, but, but it's stored on the heap um, compared to the immutable string, which is stored on the stack, if that's clear. I, is there anything else? Yeah. 
I think you can, actually. So there are a number of uh, APIs with this as well. Yeah, so there's multiple APIs here as well. Um, I think the main thing is just mutability. You can't really change it. That's primarily the um, th the big caveat there. But you do have access to quite a few. Let's see. Yeah, so we do have access to this kind of characters iterator. Um, we have access to bytes as well. Um, really, honestly, what this capital S string is, it's really, you can think of it as kind of a vector of characters. That's basically all it is. And so it gives you all the functionality of like a vector type, but overall the different uh, characters. So versus this is just something pretty much hard coded in memory. And we're saying a reference to that thing that's stored in memory as long as the program is running. Uh, yeah, so there's type, there's, you can do um, name, for example, I'm going to convert from the reference to a string. I think it, is it a string? Oh yeah, it, there's a function called to string, and this actually converts it to a string. So I can say let's um, let convert it is equal to, and you can see here, look at the in type inference just takes care of that. So convert it to a string, um, and then basically the way you would convert from this uh, this larger type is you would just use an aspersand symbol and take a reference to it, and that would work. Just fine. So I can say a reference to like this. And then I can say uh, name. And notice how it says it's a reference to a capital string, but it's essentially interchangeable with this. Like I believe I can even cast it to this, and it would be perfectly fine. So you, they're kind of interchangeable, they have different purposes. You know, one is if you're, and it's really only like I would say very relevant and resource constrained environments like embedded devices and stuff you might not have access to like the heap um, so you would want to use a stack and then that's where you would want to use something like uh, you know a reference to a string or a reference to a, a custom array of characters but that's you know these are more like lower level uh, programming concepts yeah okay did everyone implement the the process okay nice if we're ready to do that, then we can actually work on actually kind of just like using it. Then we can use our factory API and use all of these different things. So if we have people which have done that, I'm going to go ahead and get started on that process. So now go away from factory.rs and go into main.rs under the same folder, right into the um, actual area of our scratch pad. And then right under the to do right here, this will probably be commented. So go ahead and erase these two comments. Because now what we want to do is we want to use the types from factory instead of our main.rs. So we want to use factory and or process. So make sure this is uncommented. Uh, and one thing to note is notice how we said mod factory. So by default, each Rust file, like external Rust, Rust file, is a module. And we can import that module and use the types within. And notice that, for example, like factory is public which is why that I can import it inside of my main.rs. And of course, main.rs has our main function, which is the entry point for every Rust program. So every executable has to have a, a main function similar to C. So let's go ahead and get our factory running. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to declare a new or process. So we're going to say let or process is equal to or process. And then we're going to use the two curly braces to then put our fields in here. So amounts, and we're just going to put 20 for our amounts. And then the next thing we will do, and don't worry, I'll have this up on the screen soon. We want to actually create our factory. And I'm going to actually make this mutable since we're going to be uh, modifying it. Let me just, so factory, colon, colon, new. Since we're instantiating a new factory, we're not going to use a dot operator. And I'm going to give it an ID of zero. It doesn't really matter. You can put whatever you like. Um, and then what I will do is I will then say factory dot add new process and I will add the or process from before. And lastly, the last step is simply just to run a factory. You can say factory dot run. And once you have this typed up, then we can actually run this. Um, and it will just give some really basic output. But that's kind of, you've gone through the whole gist of implementing and then using a generic API and notice how like this factory is already inferred as, oh, it's a factory with an or process. And that or process follows what the process trait kind of gives to us. So we know exactly what to do with that. The factory knows exactly how to handle that 
due to the trait. So when you have this done, you can give a raise of hand or simply run the same command as before, which is cargo run dash dash bin scratch pad. And I'll just give a couple of minutes for that to kind of uh, go through. And if you do run cargo run, you should see this output. I'm, I'm going to go back and look at this function a little bit more. But yeah, just shoot any questions. So, oh, do you, do you want the command or just the output itself? Yeah. yeah, output should be this. So if you get this, then you're golden. Yeah, there might be a couple of small warnings. Um, don't worry about those unless it impedes on the functionality. Also, for like a first Rust program, this is probably not something you would write right off the bat. Like it's quite like some concepts to wrap your head around. It takes time. Um, and I'll mention some resources to further dive into uh, kind of some of these concepts. Um, but it's how you can achieve, you know, when you have a very generic approach, you, you have this trade-off of abstraction, like very abstract, but also high custom, you know, you can customize it however you like, which is really great in some, in some scenarios. But then there's some people who just want to use default types, which is completely fine. And there's those options too. Like, you know, you don't have to implement, and that's the point which I'm going to get to with like substrate and polka dot. There's like implementations for all this stuff. You don't have to sit here and like, write all this code, like boilerplate kind of, of like, oh, now I have to implement this. And that. I mean, there are in some cases when you want to do really custom stuff, but Substrate c takes care of all this stuff for you. This is just scratching the surface of what's behind it. So yeah, if everyone successfully ran it, um, or if you have any questions, please interrupt me and let me know. And of course, you know, if you really want to, you could add uh, another process. You can you know, do this or process underscore two, and you can change the amount to 16, factory, the add new process, and then you could add second process, cargo run, and then it's gonna simply output the, you know, the two processes actually running. Yep. Nope, nope, nope. So what we're writing right now, maybe I should have specified this, this is just vanilla Rust. Like, yeah, this has nothing to do with blockchain right now. This is, you know, regular binaries which you can write on your computer that will run on, you know, anything. But yeah, if this is, I'm gonna go and just kind of continue uh, wrapping up this. Um, so the summary, so what did we do exactly? We'll define the factory process, how it operates via a trait. We create a new process, and then we run our factory. Um, you can actually expand this example into many different things. And this is actually quite analogous to how blockchains work. You know, the factory here could be Polkadot. The processes could be its respective parachains. Um, you know, each Polkadot kind of generalizes over, I don't care what your parachain is. I just care that it s fulfills these requirements. It works the same exact way. Um, and you know, you can really have fun with this project. You can put multi-threading for each process. You could have a multi-process factor with different process types and really get deep into it if you like. So I think one thing which might be kind of cool to close off with since we have around 17, 17 minutes left. Yeah. Um, we're going to look at a substrate palette. So we just got done, you know, writing considerably really like a lot of boilerplate code. We're implementing traits from scratch and these kind of complicated generic types. Let's look at what an actual substrate palette is. Now, a palette is a blockchain module, and it's not like a smart contract. It's actually like a core module for a blockchain. You could base a blockchain off of one palette if you like. Um, 
but usually substrate chains are based off of multiple pallets. The pallets could be a consensus mechanism, block authoring, um, like these core things, or it could be something like, you know, like a social media pallet platform thing if you want to as well. So this specific pallet um, was a project from a long time ago. It's called Uke, and it was a messaging platform. So you're gonna see kind of uh, some of the traits Right? So you notice that each pallet, the main thing to pay attention to is that it has a config trait. So each pallet has a trait to configure it. So you can say that I don't care what the blockchain that's implementing this pallet is, as long as it gives me what a runtime event looks like, tells me the maximum username length, the message amount, whatever else you decide to put in there, um, this will fulfill the requirements for my pallet. And then like later on, and then later on you can use this. For example, I can say, okay, well my maximum message amount is gonna be, you know, let's say like 16 messages or, you know, which is very low. Um, then in my storage, you know, I can say like, okay, well, as long as that buys my me message amount, and you can use the same kind of syntax to access the associated type. This is just, a, just more associated types. Um, so, br you know, this is obviously like a simple example of how that occurs, because you can customize the blockchain palette to take in your parameters and then use those values within in your palettes and your program. And for example, how that looks like later on is like, look, for example, I can say, okay, I wanna implement the palettes configuration for this blockchain's runtime. And here's what I wanna, and here's what I wanna set it to. So I have like an event type, so my blockchain events look like. I have my maximum username length, which is 16 characters, maximum conversation ID length, 64, et cetera. And you could put whatever you like in here as your configuration parameters. And you can even see here, exploring a little bit more, and this is slightly more verbose, is like this is how fees are managed. Fees are managed through a palette. And you can see here how there's multiple ways to even like uh, consider the type in which the currency of the fees is paid in. So you can even change this like a multi-asset setup, like paying fees in another asset. That's the type of custom, you know, the, the, the yeah. There's lots of stuff. If you explore a block, uh, one of the substrate runtimes, you're gonna see like it's a very beefy file, and most of it is just you implementing uh, palette configurations. Let's see. And then at the end, you know, um, what happens is all those palettes get algamated into the runtime and compiled onto WebAssembly. So it's it's pretty cool, um, how that kind of works. But at the top, before you get to the WebAssembly point, you're configuring traits and associated types. And that's kind of the syntax to get used to, which is the process that we just went through. You'll also notice uh, one more thing is that there's going to be a lot of macro usage. So like, look at this, for example. Um, let's look at a good one. Like palette storage, like blockchain storage, right? Uh, versus having to like manage and use core substrate storage, which is just a macro, which just lets you um, uh, kind of declare that. And it will expand it down into a bunch of code of implementing various traits and generating types. All you have to do is just declare how you want your storage to act. In this case, it's like, oh, how I want to hash my keys, you know, what I want my keys to be. This is a storage map. And then what I want to get from that key, which is like a user. So in this specific example, what I'm doing is I'm getting a username and then I'm getting a user, you know, uh, getting some user information from that and then returning that. But this is kind of out of the scope of this kind of workshop. Uh, it's just kind of going through the capabilities. Uh, and again, you don't really have to worry about most of that stuff. Yeah, you just have to simply type this and then configure your storage and then you're done. Then you use your storage later. And yep, this is pretty much what I just talked about. A good place, and I'm going to shill the Polkadot SDK Rust docs. If you have a question on how like something really works and you really want to look at it, the best place to go are the Rust docs like 98% of the time. Um, because it's gonna include like in-depth documentation on like these abstract parameters. And while most of these are not, you don't have to worry about, like you don't have to worry about really what a base call filter is or or things like that. They, they can be interesting to read. You know, we're talking about very core blockchain primitives here. This is not something that the everyday, maybe even Web3 developer is gonna be looking at. But you can if you wish. And yeah, that's it. If you have any questions, please drop them. Or if you want to look at something, or um, all ears, yeah. Well, we finished early. Oh yeah, I have more slides. Where to go next? So if you want to learn more stuff, the Rust book, number one resource. Um, there's a cool like building a Rust state machine from scratch 
by Sean Tabrizi, which is one of the core developers of Polkadot. Um, Substrate node template, if you're brave enough, go give it a try. Try to compile it. Um, it's usually as simple as running cargo run on the whole thing, and then your blockchain just starts running locally on your computer. So feel free to do that. And then you'll see all the runtime stuff I talked about, etc. Um, there's also some good blog posts like Substrate in a nutshell, and then more on generics and associated types. This is a really good article, which kind of gives you the breakdown of how those work. Um, and yeah, the, I think s you guys already have the form, but the form is also available for this workshop from Sasha. Um, other than that, yep, thank you guys. Th thank you. Can we give another round of applause? Thanks for sticking by.